Hey guys, V. Rigoni, Max, High Performance Real Estate Entrepreneur. And so today what we're going to talk about is don't fight the Fed. That's an old saying used mostly in the stock market, but it's also used in the real estate market. Because if you fight the Fed, you're going to get burned. Why? Because they control the game. Before we get started, let's smash the like button. Let's subscribe to the channel. So the Fed, I'm getting hearing people all the time now saying it's a good time to buy real estate. OK, it's a good time to get in there because the Fed paused on raising interest rates and you're going to get the prices are down and this is a good time. And you know what I say? I say that's kind of sounds like to me because I've always said real estate takes a long time to go up, takes a long time to roll over and it takes a long time to go down and bottom out. And so you don't have to jump on it on the day you think because people are out there telling you that it's a good time. You'll know it's a good time. But let's talk about the Fed. If you understand how the Fed works, you're going to understand the more of how the economy works. If you understand more how the economy works, then you're going to know for yourself that it's a good time to buy or it's not. Because you need to learn this stuff for yourself. Okay, It's taken me 40 years of doing this. Now, I'm not saying you got to wait 40 years to learn it. It's the wisdom, because what I'm also hearing these gurus say, and they're just now starting to talk about it, that they're starting to read books of, from people who, who've been around for a long time. Because most of the guys that have gotten wealthy in real estate today, they started in 2010, 2011, and that's when they started getting their success. So they've only seen an up market. They've never had to fight the Fed. The Fed has been in their corner for 12 years. That's what I'm trying to get to understand. Even they're getting it. So they're making these predictions. They're telling you, I mean, I got one guy I'm listening to. He says in the fourth quarter, they're going to cut interest rates. Hell, in June, they paused, but they said they're still going to plan on maybe raising it two more times. So when's he thinking that we're going to run out of 2023? And I'm not even saying they're talking their book because they really don't have anything to sell in that sense. They're just trying to be eternally optimistic. Well, if you're eternally optimistic, it's like taking a bullet to the head. You just you can't always be eternally optimistic when it comes to real estate. There are cycles. Be optimistic about the cycle. And when you understand the cycle, then you will understand when it's time to come in and buy. Basically, you're looking at a situation where in, in December 31st, all through the year of 2021, you had the Federal Reserve, you had the White House, telling you that we're in a transitory inflationary environment as they were printing so much damn money forget the wheelbarrows you needed dump trucks and semis to carry it they're telling you all that time that it's going it's transitory we don't really have an inflation problem it'll come down and these are the people that we're supposed to know all right now i don't think the white house knows anything OK, it's run pretty much just off of politics. But what about the Federal Reserve? I recently heard that they have like 400 PhDs working for them. Now, maybe I'm wrong on the number, but it's probably pretty close to that. I mean, you can't make this stuff up about about the fact that they sat there, they printed seven trillion dollars and then they're telling you that inflation is transitory. They were stating in, in 2021, October, November, into, into December, that by the following summer, which would have been the summer of last year, that inflation was going to be at 2%. I mean, how? What I'm trying to do is give you some context. You've lived through it, but the question is, did you understand what was going on when you were living through it? And so that's what we're going to be dealing with it, is give you some context so you can understand what's happening. Now, you get into 2021, all of a sudden you move forward through this process and you have a situation now where it's now December 31st, 2021. All of a sudden, Jay Powell must have been just having the, his last New Year's drink and then decided to say, hey, we're no longer transitory. Inflation is real. And he comes out in the beginning of 2022 and he starts telling everybody, it's time to raise interest rates. Like the light bulb just went off in the room. How do you go from transitory the month before to now we got a problem? When you've been the guy printing all the damn money. Yeah, this is this stuff can get you, you know, get you riled up a little bit. So then what do they start to do? They start to look, you got a situation where he says, we got to start raising these rates. So I think it was in March of 2022, he starts raising the rates. You move through the year, he's raising the rates. Oh, and then what happens in July? OK, June and July, all of a sudden we start to go into two quarters of negative GDP. Now, two quarters of negative GDP 
What does that tell you? Well, historically, if you look in most economic books, Economics 101, it'll tell you there's two quarters of negative growth, which is kind of how do you have negative growth, right? Either growth is, I mean, it's like just negative decline. How do you have that? But they do. If you have two quarters in a row, you are now entering into a recession. This was last June, July. But according to the White House and the Fed stayed pretty quiet, and there's a reason why the Fed stayed pretty quiet, is that we weren't in a recession. We were going to redefine how we define a recession. And, you know, they said because unemployment was so good. There was very low unemployment. Well, that's because we were in a situation where, where we had a, an employment problem. We don't have enough workers coming out of COVID. People decide just to stay the hell home and still get paid. And so because you had low unemployment, they kept pushing the fact that, oh, we're not in a recession. Everything is good. No problem. And then we had all the other problems with the deliveries and of goods through through the channels, the shipping channels, all that kind of stuff, right? So we're moving through this. We're gonna we're into denial. Now, why did the White House want to deny? Well, they're gonna deny because why? They had a congressional election coming up and they wanted to make sure that the world did not think we were in a recession. So they had the narrative out there in the corporate media, basically touting the fact that, oh, this is different this time. It's always different this time. Now what was with Jay Powell? Why wasn't he pushing this? Well, because he wanted to get reelected to the Federal Reserve as the chairman. I mean, you think some of this stuff can be self-serving? You go back to the internet crisis, the internet bubble of 2000, and you got the poster child of, of the internet bubble, which was Vertical Net, and you got Alan Greenspan, <laughs> the guy who started Vertical Net's wedding. These people are insidious. So you've got Jay Powell, he wants to get reelected. This is how this stuff works. You just have to understand. He was quiet all the way up until until he decided that he was aggravated because they were going to elect a different chairman of the Federal Reserve. They had put somebody up at the end of 2021, and he didn't like that. And so then he decides that, hey, you know, maybe that's one of the reasons he got hawkish. Maybe he felt it was time to put it to the White House. I don't know. But he started raising those interest rates. He started doing it so nicely to cut that inflation that he then put us into a recession and then the White House goes into denial about the recession. So that's what's going on, all right? And that's what happened all last year. Now we come into this year. They keep raising these rates, right? And so the Federal Reserve, you would think they would figure this out over the almost 100 years in which they've been in existence, somewhere around 100 years. You'd think they would figure out the fact that they tend to overshoot Okay, they either print too much money, create too much quantitative easing. That's when they buy back securities, buy back treasuries to put more money into the economy. They usually do it too much. The other side of the coin, they raise interest rates too fast, too hard, and they create then a bigger problem. So we've been moving forward through this problem. What happened when you raised all these interest rates? Well, you killed multifamily, you killed commercial. Multifamily sales are down like 75, 78%. Multifamily buildings, apartment buildings are down anywhere from 12 to 15%. Single people say, what about single family? Well, it hasn't been hit as hard. Why? Because again, when the Fed creates the recession and slows the economy, then you end up in a situation where you have more unemployment. But in this case, that was has not been so far because we didn't have enough employees to go around. And so that's not been the issue. So it's made it more resilient. And you have most people went out and they got a two and a half, three and a half percent fixed rate mortgage on their home. And what you have more is a seller strike going on in single family homes. They don't want to sell people with a two. You know, if you're sitting there and you got a three percent mortgage for 30 years, you're beating the bank. You're kicking their ass for the first time. So if you go to sell your property and you're going to go buy another one, what are you going to replace a 3% with a 6.5? No. So just the standard, even if you're not moving to another part of the country, just the fact that people like to upgrade their properties from time to time and, and get a bigger house and all that kind of stuff, you know, they're not doing it. They're not going to cash in a 3% mortgage, a 2.5% mortgage. So you've got less properties for sale. But because of what we've talked about in the past, you've got all these homes that, that you've got still a decent amount of demand in single family because you've got people with more access to money, more access to credit, and they're spending it. But there's never been a bigger gap in decades between income and the cost of housing. It has risen through the roof. 
So eventually, it's going to continue to slow if these interest rates stay high. This is kind of what's been going on. You have what we call unintended consequences that start to take place. Look at the situation where now we're in, where they raised these interest rates. The Fed fund rate was at about zero, and they raised it now up to five and a quarter. Now, they did that so quickly that they just said, hey, we're just going to slam the economy. I'm going to be more like Paul Volcker, and I'm going to get those interest rates down, and that's where we're going to go with this. And I'm going to slow this economy down, and then everything will be good. But what about the unintended consequences? Now, what do I mean by that? I'll give you an example. In 2008, we had the financial crisis. All right, you guys all remember that, the pain of it all? If you're younger, you probably saw your parents going through it. If you're older, you went through it yourself. Do you think that financial crisis just took place in 2008 because of nothing that had taken place before that? Do you think all that mortgage fraud, all that mortgage manipulation just happened to occur? Well, it occurred because in 1999, they got rid of what was called the Glass-Steagall Act. And the Glass-Steagall Act had restricted these banks, commercial banks, on the ability to invest and be speculative. That's why you ended up with almost like two classes of banks. You had commercial banks and you had investment banks. The investment banks were more speculative. They were the Goldman Sachs of the world. They were these people that were out there that, that knew what they were doing in most cases, super smart. And then you had the, the, you know, the, the bank down the, on, at the corner, the one you go to, the commercial bank. And so because of what took place that created the depression in the 1930s, they came up with what was called the Glass-Steagall Act. And that was to restrict their ability to take risk. Well, you got Larry Summers who worked for Bill Clinton, and then you had all the Republicans too. This is both the Democrat and Republican bullshit. They got together and they rescinded the Glass-Steagall Act in 1999, which laid the, the foundation, the seeds for what took place in all of the mortgage fraud. Because now you put the commercial banks in the ability to create securities, okay, mortgage-backed securities, remember those? So that you could package up loans, and then you could take these loans, and then you could sell them to the public as securities, as investments, so as people paid their mortgage and they paid the interest on that mortgage, some of that would then go to those investors. And it was considered to be, you know, a pretty good investment, except we all know what happened, right? So you had the unintended consequence. So one of the what's one of the reasons why they got rid of the Glass-Steagall Act? Well, they were telling Bill, because he says, you know, I didn't really understand it at the time when I did it. Well, they were telling him it would allow for more people to own homes. Well, the government was doing a little bit of social engineering. I mean, that's what they're really good at, right? That social engineering? Oh yeah, they're the best. They made it very easy for more money, more liquidity to come into the mortgage market. At the same time, the unintended consequences, they reduced the FHA and, and the federally backed mortgages, okay, of government banks. They reduced requirements and mortgage requirements made it easier for the average person to go out and get a mortgage. So why wasn't there a crisis in 2001 or whatever? Well, up until that point, the interest rates had been higher, 6% for mortgages. So you still had a, an economic threshold to jump over in order to get a, a mortgage. But we all know what happened right after 9-11 and all they kept re reducing interest rates to the point of where, where mortgages where you could get a mortgage for 1%, you could get a mortgage for 2 all right? You get really low interest rate mortgages at the time. And so when you took when you took away the restrictions of people being able to, how they could qualify, they made it so easy for them to qualify, and then you had these super late, super low interest rates due to the recession that they thought was going to take place after 9-11, you had the perfect storm for everybody to get out and buy a house. And that's what they did, okay? And then you ended up with all the, the ninja loans, right? Right? The the stated loans. And what is this? What was a stated loan? It was just put down whatever you want for income, put down whatever you want for savings, and nobody was going to check, and it all went down to shitter. And that's how this thing rolled. Unintended consequences. I mean, they told Bill Clinton it would just make people make it easier for people to buy a home. And he's like, hey, I'm on board with that. Because I don't think Bill Clinton wanted the financial crisis in 2008 to happen. That's politicians trying to do things where we at today. What do I mean by the unintended consequences today? Well, the reason I explained that to you was because what's happening is look at what's going on with the commercial banks again. They're in big trouble. They're called regional banks. They supply a great deal, like 60 or 70 percent of all the money for commercial loans. Incredible amount. The commercial banks do. So when the Federal Reserve raised interest rates, it created a real problem for the banks. You've seen, you've heard, right? SVB, Silicon Valley Bank. 
First Republic. There's a bunch of other ones that are in trouble. They just keep pushing money into them, hoping that it goes away. And why are they in trouble? Well, because when these banks, what they did is they went out, and borrowed this money from the Federal Reserve at close to no interest rate, and they turned around and they bought treasury bonds. Now they bought also packages of mortgages that were that there were other companies were making for two and a half per, you know a two and a half percent return. So they bought between treasury bonds and they bought these mortgage packages themselves. Why were they doing it? Because they were arbitraging. They're getting the money for free, and if, and if they can get two percent, and then besides the amount of money they can borrow from the Federal Reserve, I think it's like for every dollar they've got, they can borrow another nine or so. Okay, so they multiply this thing out tremendously, and then. There, these banks are also then bringing in large deposits, right? The deposits over two hundred fifty thousand dollars are ones under that are insured above they're not, but they get large depositors, fifty million, a hundred million. Instead, they started using these people's money, these corporate money, other corporations' money that put their money in the bank for deposit, and they started buying treasury bonds with that money too. So if you skyrocket interest rates, when interest rates go up, I've explained this a thousand times. When interest rates go up bond values go down. Existing bond values go down. So when you zoom up interest rates through the roof, look at what happens to bond values, right? These bonds were losing up to 40% of their valuations. This is the unintended consequence of, of the Fed raising the interest rates so fast, so hot. All of a sudden then, you have the run on the banks. So my point is, in the world of real estate, in the world of business, there is something happening today that was not happening last year. And I kept saying last year when I would make, when I put information out, when I would do videos, that this was different than 2008 because we weren't going to be in a liquidity crisis. But now the Fed, the unintended consequence of raising interest rates to kill inflation is creating a problem for the banks, which may end up resulting in a liquidity crisis as we go forward. We don't know that for sure, but we do know these banks are in big trouble. So what does that mean? Well, that means that for the average person that's out there and you're listening, you want to get into real estate as an investment and you're listening to people say, hey, this is the time to do it. Understand, you've got to let this play out. And I was listening to a, a vlog the other day and, the, and this is somebody that people listen to this guy a lot. Number one, he said he didn't blame the banks for buying all these treasury bonds. Well, maybe not because the government let them do it. But what about hedging the risk? Everybody who understands bonds and interest rates understands that when you take a big bet like this, you got to hedge the risks. But why didn't they hedge those risks? Because it costs money to hedge. See, in the end, a hedge should just go down the drain, worth be worthless. But you were hedging against, you're taking big profits, you're using some of those profits to buy a hedge in case it all goes the other way. But they didn't want to do that because it would impact the returns on their banks, which would impact their salaries, their compensation packages. So he's like, he wasn't blaming the banks. And I'm like, I'm thinking to myself, wow, you got you to gotta get back into the books. You got to study this stuff a little bit more. And then he's telling people that you basically should just get out there and buy something today. Why not? You can always refinance it. Well, maybe not. Maybe you won't be able to refinance it as quickly as you think you can. Why speculate? Why turn real, real estate is not speculative. If you try to buy it now, again, I always make this as a disclaimer. If you can find a piece of property today for 40% less than the market value, I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about real estate down 5% right now because I think we're probably going to see it move further down. So that's where we're, where we're sitting right now. We've got this situation where you're looking at the marketplace. You're looking at prices coming down. You're looking at a pending liquidity crisis that, that is taking place inside of the commercial space. It's not hitting the residential space yet, but if these banks get into enough trouble, it will start to hurt them too. What's one of the reasons we know that the Fed's not may not be done raising interest rates? It's because of the spread. You got these banks borrowing money and they've increased the spread compared to what they're lending you the money for on an interest rate for a mortgage. They're borrowing it at five, five and a quarter, and they've increased their spreads out because they're scared that the Fed will come back and start to raise interest rates more. Remember, real estate goes up slowly. It takes time to roll over and peak. Then it takes time to come back down slowly. And if you understand this this one guru is telling people wouldn't you have loved to have bought homes and houses in 2009 because that was the bottom of the market no no that may have been the bottom of the market but that was the bottom market of the stock market the real estate market started rolling over in 2007 
and there was pain all the way through to about 2010. Yes, you can try to pick the bottom. There's another old saying in finance, don't try to catch a falling knife. If the knife has fallen to the ground, is that what you want to try and catch? I don't think so. Because when the opportunity comes, when they get to the point where the Fed is absolutely done raising interest rates, because what is he calling for in the fourth quarter of this year? He's calling for what he defines as a recession. So let me get this straight. When we started in a recession back in July of last year, they said, oh, it's different this time. Now, I kind of think we've been in a recession so, since last July. Look at container ships. Marsic there, the, the people that, that ship, they, their rates have dropped 40%. You're just not seeing it come through. There's a lag, okay? Even the Fed understands there's a lag. There's a lag between the time you raise interest rates, the time you start to kill inflation. There's a lag in all of this, that it takes time for the economy to, to, to absorb it and then produce the numbers that we then are able to understand whether or not we're actually in a, you know, in a deeper recession or it's gonna get better. They always say, you don't really know you're in a recession until you've come out of it. Isn't that nice? But my point is, is that we are in such turmoil right now in this economy. And I'm not even talking about worldwide coups in Russia and all that craziness. I'm talking about just the economy right here. Because if you run out and you buy something and you're wrong, will 10 years from now, will it matter? Probably not, especially in a single family rental. But why are you that hungry that you have to go out and buy something? Sometimes the best investment is the one you didn't make. And this may be one of those moments when you don't want to make that investment. Now you might say, yeah, but Vic, you're a real estate guy. I am, but there's a time to buy, a time to hold and a time to sell. Right now we're in the hold mode. We don't know where this economy is going to go. Remember, if the Fed is finally going to acknowledge the fact that they feel that we're going to go into a recession in the fourth quarter of this year, my point would be, how bad is it really going to be then? Because they've been in denial for the last year. And so how bad do they think it's really going to be? Well, they're the only ones that know because they get to raise the interest rates again. They're talking about two more rate hikes before the end of the year, unless the numbers really show recessionary numbers. If we start to get deeper and deeper type recessionary numbers, but you're having a hard time with that because the unemployment is the lowest it's ever been because there's an employee crisis in this country, right? There's not enough people yet to go to work. And so you have wage inflation taking place. So they're fighting this wage inflation at the same time they're trying to get the economy to slow down. You might say, well, why should you listen to me? That's ridiculous, right? Why listen to me? What do I know? Well, I lived through this. I had a real estate company. I started a real estate company in 1981, 81, 82. I was in real estate. I sat there and I watched this happen. Now, I was at a young age, hopefully the age you're at now. So economically, it, it didn't impact me quite as much because, you know, it, it delayed my career from going. But I saw the inflation of the late 70s. I saw when Paul Volcker came in and he created a man-made, well, I guess they're always man-made, but a Fed-made recession. When they do that, it takes time to happen. And number one, sometimes they try and they think they beat inflation and then they pull back and then inflation will roar again. That may occur also. Now, like I said, Jay Paul seems, more, seems to have become more like Paul Volcker than Arthur Burns of the, of the Fed chair of the 1970s. But we don't know because he's got these other problems. He's got a wage inflation problem that he can't deal with. He's now got a liquidity problem. So he may have to stop raising interest rates because of, of these two things, right? Because it has an impact. So where do you go? Why should you do this? Well, like I said, I've been there. I've owned real estate. I owned real estate in the late in the late 80s, from about the middle 80s all the way up through and then through the 90s and all the way through. Once it takes time, that recession was a five year recession at some locations. In other locations, it was four because, again, economies are local. But something that may have taken now, I get it. Things move faster today. We've talked about that in the past. Things do move faster, but that doesn't mean that economics change. They just don't change. Yes, something that may have taken four years in the 1980s may only take two years now. We've talked about that. And if we've already been in this recession, which I think we have been for the last year, well, we may have another year to go. Does that mean you should run out and buy a piece of real estate today? No. Does that mean you should go out and buy a business today? Well, maybe. And maybe there's a 
a price on a piece of real estate, like I said, that's down 40% or whatever. So it doesn't matter. You can get that thing so cheap, go ahead and buy it. If your aunt or your uncle selling you something at a giant discount, go ahead and buy it. But what are the risks? The risks are if the recession gets deeper, the risks are if they don't start to cut interest rates anytime soon. Now one assumes that if the recession gets deeper, then they'll eventually will start to cut interest rates, right? Because remember, you know, you get to a point in the economy where bad news for the economy becomes good news for cutting interest rates. And we're not there yet, folks. We're still in the camp where good news for the economy is bad news for interest rates because they don't want to cut them. I know this is a lot of information, but what I'm trying to get you to understand is this stuff happens over and over again. And it's like Mark Twain said, you know, history doesn't necessarily repeat itself but it does rhyme because things change as far as laws and rules and regulations. Size of economy makes a difference. We're a much bigger economy than we were in the 1980s. Everything more digital, things move faster. I get all that, but well, there's a time to buy and a time to hold and a time to sell. When you wait, what you're doing is you're reducing your risk. You might say, oh, but I'm gonna reduce my opportunity. Let me ask you a question. Let's say this fellow is absolutely right and the bottom of the market was 2009 for real estate. And if you'd have gone in, you would have been, you know, buying when there's blood in the streets. And that's great. And I'm a great proponent of that. But if you'd have waited another year and bought in 2010 or a year and a half or two years in 2011, how do you think that worked out for you by, by 2021? Pretty damn good. Because why take the risk? It's not necessary. The returns will be there. Don't take an investment that will get you rich and turn it into a speculative investment that you're going to regret. There's a lot of people out there that are regretting the fact that they bought apartment buildings last year and the year before. And remember, like we talked about, and they bought these apartment buildings with adjustable interest rate mortgages because when they did their underwriting on the property, their performance on the property, the only way they could make these things cash flow was to get an adjustable interest rate. And when you get an adjustable interest rate, that's great, but why the hell would you want an adjustable interest rate at a decade low number? And the only place interest rates pretty much can go is up. And they are all paying the price today. Like we've talked about, they've got properties that were positive cash flow, now they're negative cash flow. On top of that, in commercial land, okay, in commercial loan land, you have properties that are gonna be coming up, billions of dollars worth of loans that are gonna be coming due over the next six months to a year in which no longer are the valuations there for those buildings, no longer are they willing to lend money like they were willing to lend before, and you may start to see some great deals come on the market. Another old saying is, all right, and since I'm you know, the OG of real estate here, sometimes you gotta keep your powder dry. Now, for you guys who don't know what that means, that means back in the day when they had muskets, if your gunpowder was wet, nothing was going to work and you were going to die. So keep your powder dry. Right now, you want to be learning. You want to be gaining information. Learn about these markets. If you're going to be buying in clean Texas, outside of Austin, learn about that market. Know everything there is about that market. Watch the prices compress. Watch the cap rates go up, right? When cap rates go up, prices of commercial property goes down. Now, you might say, yeah, but if I can buy that apartment building today and I can't buy it because there's no liquidity next year, I might be better off buying it today. When it comes to apartment buildings, you know, there's Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, they provide the financing and they're mandated to do this. And they've only used up about 50% of their money that they were given this year. That's not an issue with apartment buildings. The liquidity crisis won't be as big of a problem in apartment buildings. They, it'll become much bigger for retail, for industrial, but there's gonna be opportunities. Keep your powder dry, and when the time comes, you're gonna know it, and you don't have to just listen to me to know it, you'll see it. When bad news for the economy becomes something that the stock market's rallying on, okay, why would the stock market rally on bad news? The stock market will rally on bad news because it knows that the Fed's going to cut interest rates and then they're going to invest more money. When bad news for the economy means that when the interest rates come down, that means that mortgage rates will come down. That means that's good for real estate investors. When bad news makes the stock market rally, makes interest rates come start to come down, or at least they start to talk about it, then you know that's time to use some of that powder. 
Then you know it's time to pull that trigger. Then you know it's just time to start to buy and then game on. Remember, what do I say? Think big, start small, grow fast. Talk to you soon. V. Ragoni, Max, High Performance Real Estate Entrepreneur. Follow this channel for more information and we'll also tell you when we think it's ready to start to buy. But I've been telling people for the last 18 months to wait. When people were telling them everybody time, you just wait six months, time to buy. I said, no way, it's gonna take time. All right, think big, start small, grow fast.